everyone, welcome back to another episode of Script Apart, a podcast about the first draft secrets of great movies and TV shows. I'm Al Horner, and this week on the show, he's back and so is the Overlook Hotel. Yes, it's the return of one of the great horror auteurs of our time, the one and only Mike Flanagan, making his second appearance on Script Apart. I know it's only been a couple of weeks since our last chat with Mike, delving into his incredible Netflix series Midnight Mass. But honestly, the response to that episode from you guys, the listeners, was so emphatic that we couldn't wait to invite Mike back on to get lost in the Overlook-esque hedge maze of another great work of his. That's right, you guessed it, the shining references aren't exactly subtle. This time with Mike, we're talking about Doctor Sleep, his miraculous 2019 adaptation of Stephen King's sequel to The Shining. Now, I use the word miraculous because it really is astonishing to me what this film managed to achieve, knitting together the legacies of two notoriously different visions of The Shining. A quick history lesson in case anyone's not up to speed. Stephen King wrote his novel The Shining in 1977, when Stanley Kubrick made drastic changes to King's source text in his film adaptation of the story three years later. It didn't go down that well. In fact, it led to some serious contempt between these two absolute masters of their craft. Fans have been divided ever since over which version is the more powerful. King's novel, which had a different ending, and a slightly sunnier message about the capacity for love to triumph over evil, or Kubrick's ruthless cinematic journey into male madness, the bloody endgame of toxic masculinity, as embodied by Jack Nicholson's version of Jack Torrance. When Mike was presented with the chance to adapt King's 2013 book, Dr. Sleep, which continued the canon of King's story, ignoring Kubrick's changes, he decided to attempt the impossible. His version of Dr. Sleep was to marry the visual language of Kubrick's Shining with the storytelling that King favored, honoring both iterations. The film brought back the psychic survivor of cinema's most famous haunted hotel, Danny Torrance, and forced him to reckon with the alcohol addiction present both in himself and in the father that tried to murder him decades earlier. The story of how Mike pulled the film off and the seismic personal changes that it sparked in his own life is a tale as fascinating as the film itself, which is saying something. Doctor Sleep is a fevered festival of telekinetic children, traveling vampiric bohemians, and the courage that it takes to beat addiction. And though the film didn't perform well at the box office on release, it's since found a passionate community of devoted fans who rightly consider it to be a masterpiece. Full disclosure, I am definitely among that community, so you can imagine how fun a time I had talking with Mike for two spoilerific hours about this incredible movie. Be sure to listen out at the end for some mind-blowing information on the sequels and spin-offs that its disappointing commercial performance sadly stopped from going ahead, as well as a note of optimism that we may actually see some of Dr. Sleep's characters on screen again, featuring in Mike's upcoming adaptation of King's The Dark Tower. As I say, this is a bumper-length episode with so much great advice and insight into Mike's creative process, so I really hope you enjoy this episode. Before we jump in, can I take a quick second though to remind you that Script Apart is on Patreon. If you like what we do and would like to see the show continue to grow, you can head over to our Patreon page to get ad-free episodes, early access to episodes, the chance to put your questions to upcoming guests, and access to our brand new video bonus segment called Postscript, in which producer Cam and I talk about each week's new episode as it drops, breaking down our big takeaways from the conversation and expanding upon our relationship with that filmmaker's work. Head to patreon.com forward slash script apart if you'd like to get involved there. We really do appreciate your support. Okay, that's the admin out of the way. Let's get into it, shall we? This is the amazing Mike Flanagan discussing the first draft secrets of Dr. Sleep. Thanks so much for tuning in. You're listening to Script Apart, hosted by me, Al Horner, produced by Camille Demek. Hey, Mike, welcome back to Script Apart. It's great to have you back with us. How are you doing today? Uh, I'm doing so good. It's such a joy to be back with you. Yeah, man. You've, you've just got back from holiday in Ireland, right? Like, or yes. I, I assume it was a holiday. Like, Part of me wonders if you were just going there to brush up on your Rose the Hat impression for today's conversation. <laughs> <laughs> um, it was, it was a, one, of, one of the very rare like real holidays I've, I've gotten to take. And uh, it was so wonderful. My, my family 
generations ago uh, as from County Kildare. So it was really, I'm the first Flanagan to go back to Ireland since my great, great grandfather left. Yeah. And um, so it was really wonderful. And I, I got to drive, uh, drive on the other side of the road and terrify my wife. <laughs> and, um, but we did, we did Dublin, Galway, Clifton, and then Kildare. And uh, we ended the trip when I was supposed to do all the big ancestral stuff. Uh, both Kate and I came down with a horrible stomach flu and we never left the hotel. <laughs> yeah. oh, no, I'm so sorry. <laughs> so, yeah. Uh, now I have to go back. So uh, it, it well, was there you go. half of a great trip. <laughs> Well, uh, yeah, as I just alluded to, we are talking about Dr. Sleep today. And uh, man, the more time that passes since that film and specifically the director's cut, the more I'm struck by the amazing balancing act that the movie achieves and the kind of, I guess, the, the peace deal that it brokers between two very different tellings of The Shining. So your film somehow manages to honor both King's version of The Shining, which had a, I think had a certain optimism that was kind of missing from Kubrick's telling. And, uh, and of course, the 1980 movie version, which for me is one of, well, my favorite films, one of the greatest movies ever made, in my opinion. Um, so, yeah, I guess my, my first question, Mike, is not particularly sophisticated. How? <laughs> How did you manage to reconcile <laughs> those two fairly opposed versions of The Shining that had, of course, resulted in considerable hostility between the two authors? Um, well, I think the, uh, there, there's a long answer and a short answer to that, of course. <laughs> uh, I think the the short answer to that is barely, um, and the you know the long answer that that question how was was really that was the animating question for me for two years of my life and and I was sick to my stomach the whole time I, I completely agree with you that um, Kubrick's film is is one of my all time favorites it's a it's a masterpiece it's it's an incredible piece of cinema. It is not a very good adaptation of the novel *The Shining*. It 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 excises huge things, uh, not only with with plot points but thematically. That you know, I think we're at the beating heart of King's story, and creates something new. And and you know, I don't fault it for that whatsoever because without it, we wouldn't have Kubrick's masterpiece. But um, but I can completely understand why King famously you know, took, took the opinion that he took of, of, of the shining. <laughs> um, it's, it's, it's a profoundly personal novel for Stephen King. And, you know, it's, it's written at a time in his life when he's really looking at his own alcoholism and looking at his family and imagining kind of playing out this nightmare scenario of, of what his addiction could do to them. And, he ends the the book on on a note of sacrifice and redemption for Jack Torrance, who overcomes the the influences of the Overlook enough to to save his family. And um, Kubrick jettisons all of that uh, in favor of a a brutal uh, and cold. And and you know uh, and haunting ending, where Jack is just gone, and you you kind of get the feeling King has said you know that Jack was on the brink of killing his family the whole movie anyway, like the, the hotel just just kind of had to nudge him, but um but but yeah so so reconciling that it was a you know we could we could spend the whole your your entire episode talking about. <laughs> about that it's it, it's a huge question and you know i my goal was to try to to bring as much of the heart and the the point of both the shining and dr sleep novels to the foreground while doing it using the visual language of kubrick's film and to try to parent trap these things together <laughs> um and uh and whether it, the degree to which it did or didn't work is is entirely subjective. But I, I came out of it feeling uh, relieved that that we made it. And and Steve loved the movie and the Kubrick estate loved the movie. So I, I felt like I remember saying, like, if if um, if nothing else, like if the movie crashes and burns, at least it's a success because of of those two things. That's all I need. Uh, and then the movie uh, did crash and burn in the in the theatrical release. So, 
I kind of got what I, what I asked for, but, um, but yeah, how, how granular do you want to get about that? It's it from a process perspective, it was, it was pretty crazy, but I don't want to yeah. ramble at you. <laughs> Um, no, we can get very granular over the course of this episode. Um, yeah, it, it sounds like just to touch on something you mentioned there, it's it sounds like not only did you manage to kind of, you know, win over Steve with your adaptation, you know, you'd obviously worked worked together before you'd done Gerald's game, but um, it sounds like not only was he very happy, very satisfied with what you created, but it actually softened his view on a movie that for decades had been famously something he was quite aggrieved about did am, am i right in thinking that that it actually kind of he expressed to you it changing his perception of kubrick's film yes he he's it was one of the first things he said to me after he saw the movie um was he said that that dr sleep warmed him to kubrick's and and absolutely softened his his kind of sharpness for it and that the two together satisfied him and 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 kind of diffused a lot of that that tension and anger that it had lived for for so long which was a mind-blowing thing to hear um <laughs> and but I, I guess um i i guess maybe the the way to i can let me take you back to the very beginning of of the whole thing yeah, and we can we can kind of work our way up to that moment in in bangor with steve at the end because i feel like that's <laughs> that's such the perfect ending to the to the saga of this movie but it it all started because i went into warner brothers to have a meeting um, about dc it was a general meeting with john berg talking about whether there was anything in the dc universe that i could be a fit for was it clayface it, you were pitching i really want to do clayface yeah <laughs> i i i went in and said, you know, if you if you want to do some horror leaning DC stuff, you know, boy, do I have a great uh, take on on Clayface. I'd love to do that movie. And then if not, you know, I, I wanted to talk about Scarecrow and Justice League Dark and Constantine. And and I kind of threw everything up there and, and then said in as a child, I used to dress up as Superman because that was my that was my hero. Christopher Reeve. Superman was my hero. And and um and the meeting kind of went nowhere. They, they, he didn't really grab in onto any of that stuff and kind of casually asked about um, the movie I was editing at the time. I was just finishing Gerald's game. And he said, oh, you did a, you did a King movie. I said, oh yeah, it was a dream come true to do a Stephen King movie. I wanted to do Gerald's game forever. And he's really happy with it. And it was, you know, I thought it was unfilmable for most of my life. So it was, it was such a joy to get in there and do that movie. And he said, Oh, did you ever, uh, you know, I, I'm a huge King fan. And, and I, before I moved over to DC, I was working on our adaptation of Dr. Sleep. Um, and I said, yes, I'm, aw I'm very aware. I, I've been asking for a meeting on that movie since, uh, since I first signed with my agency and I could, I could never get in the room. Um, and he said, well, you're in the room right now. What would you do? Uh, have you read our script? And I said, yes, I've read your script. And, and with, with great respect, uh, I, I have to say, I don't think it's the right approach. Um, and was this the Akiba Goldsman script that was kicking yes. around? Yes, it was. And uh, I said, I, I think that's a different movie. I think that's not, it's not Dr. Sleep. It's something else. And, and um, it's, it's doing the same thing in a lot of ways that Kubrick did with The Shining in, in that it, it was straying so far from the source material as to create something else. Only it it didn't feel like a Kubrickian masterpiece. It, it just kind of felt like a studio hodgepodge of a of a thing. And and um and I said what I would do uh, if it were up to me, um when I read the book, I was so happy to be back with Dan Torrance, and I was so enamored with Rose the Hat as an antagonist, one of the best King antagonists at the time in, in many years, I'd thought. Um, and I, I loved Abra so much, and I, I just thought the story was wonderful. Um, and where it fell apart for me in the read was that from the very beginning of the book, when you're with little Danny and Wendy in Florida, and Mrs. Massey's returned and is in the tub and, and everything, all of the images in my head were Kubrick's and that's just because that movie infiltrates your mind and and you know takes a permanent residence there and and I said I I was with it all the way until the end um 
when he goes to the to the the field that used to be the overlook, but the overlook burned down. So now it's kind of a cu- couple picnic tables and and like a porta potty. <laughs> And I was like, I just, I was so hungry for that final confrontation to bring it all back full circle to, to the source of Danny's trauma and, and to be in Kubrick's overlook. Um, that's what I would do. And John said, well, I, I, I bet if you change the ending of Dr. Sleep, I mean, you're kind of, you're, you're, you're stepping right onto the landmine, aren't you? <laughs> um, you know, I, I bet Steve isn't going to like that. I said, I bet you're absolutely right. I think um, the thing I would sell him on is, you know, what if we change the ending of Dr. Sleep? Um, but what if we give him the ending of The Shining uh, from the novel? And what if Dan fulfills his father's destiny in, in King's World? And the whole arc just becomes about Dan and Abra. And uh, and Dan gets Jack's ending. Um and uh, and John smiled and, and liked it and said, all right, well, we'll think about it. And I left the meeting and, and walked to my car um, and I called Trevor Macy, my, my producing partner at Intrepid. And he said, how'd it go? And I said, nothing's, nothing's coming out of it. Uh, he said, but he brought up Dr. Sleep and it was fun to talk about that. And what I didn't know is by the time I made it to my car, he had called Stephen King and said, <laughs> hey, I just had Flanagan in here were you happy with Gerald's game? And he said, yeah. And he said, you know, he, he might want to take a swing at Dr. Sleep. What do you think? And Steve said, sure. Um, and so we immediately suddenly were in this very precarious position because my relationship with Stephen King was brand new. I'd never spoken to the man in person. You know, uh, we sent Gerald's game off and I got a, an email back about what he thought of the movie and I framed it and it's in my office to this day. Um, but I'd never talked to him. And uh, and I didn't know if John had pitched, you know, doing doing the Kubrick Overlook. And I was pretty sure he hadn't because I, I felt like that would have stopped the conversation. Uh, so I was terrified and, and I wanted to get the project going. But if Stephen King didn't want to do it that way, I was going to walk away because um, I didn't want to jeopardize that relationship. And so we made a pitch. And said, so this is what I would do, uh, you know, be as faithful to the book as I possibly can with Dan, Abra and Rose and the true knot. Although I felt that there was an opportunity, which we can get to later, that we could change the fates of some of the characters to make the make the stakes a little higher. Um, and uh, and I said, but the big thing's the ending. I wanted I want to move the final fight to the actual overlook. I want to say the overlook is standing and condemned and the the response came back absolutely not <laughs> <laughs> and um and i said wait 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 before before you say no i just want you to imagine the following scene you know um the overlook treated danny like a battery that's what dick halloran says in the novel um so if dan thinks the overlook could be useful to attack Rose, which is which is consistent with the Doctor Sleep ending, he he brings her there on purpose because he thinks the forces and the energies there will will want to feed on her, and that could give him an edge. Um, that he'd have to go wake it up, and he'd have to walk in and power up this old monster uh, to be ready for the fight. So imagine he walks through the empty hotel, and the lights are coming on as as it starts to kind of siphon some energy from Dan and he makes it to the gold room. We see the bar, we see a drink poured for him. Um, and he goes and he sits down and he's eight years sober. And so he's going to think about it. And then you see a familiar bartender, you know, in, in, in the red, uh, the red tux, uh, the vest and, and, and he says, good evening, Mr. Torrance. And, they have a conversation, but imagine that that's his father, who's now the the people who are chewed up by the hotel, much like Delbert Grady, you know, was they become the help, and they deny who they were. You know, he says, "No, no, you're mistaken. You're thinking of someone else." And they talk about sobriety, um, and that was my pitch, and. Uh, and there was a beat and then Steve came back and said, okay, do it. And, um, and so I went off to write and, uh, 
writing it was really <laughs> um, crazy because so I started by I had to rewatch The Shining. I had to reread The Shining and I had to read Dr. Sleep um, again. And so I, I had hard covers of The Shining and Dr. Sleep there that I've annotated to the point of just obliterating them. Um, and I had Kubrick's movie essentially on a loop and I would be chapter skipping back and forth. I've probably seen The Shining now just uh, more than a hundred times just from this process. And, um, and then I had a blank final draft document open on my, my laptop and kind of to my left hand, I had the shining novel to my right hand. I had the Dr. Sleep novel in front of me was the movie. Um, and I started working on an outline first and, um, came up with a, a structure that I felt like hit all the beats and it was a huge movie. Uh, it was just, it was a five act movie. Um, it, I mean, it was, it, the story was so complex and, you spent so much time building Dan, Abra, and Rose separate from each other before they finally, you know, first Dan and Abra, but then finally Rose start interacting. It's it's deep in the story. And the rest is all character development. And I thought, what a fascinating structure for something. The, the book was masterful in the way it bounced between these three worlds and then funneled them all into, into a point. And, and for me, I said, if that point can be the Overlook Hotel, and then I'm going to put Dr. Sleep down and pick up the Shining novel and go through the last act of that. Um, how cool would that be? And so um, I agonized over the script. Uh, the good news was I was shooting at the time. Um, I was filming The Haunting of Hill House in Atlanta. And I would work on Dr. Sleep whenever I had a break, Sometimes I was working on it um, at the monitor of, of Hill House. Uh, it was a way to pull my brain out of Hill House and and give it something else to to chew on. And Hill House was a brutal experience. Hill House to this day is the worst uh, production experience I've ever had. Really? And I oh it was it was awful. And and I I frequently needed a way out of it. I needed to be out of that mindset and Dr. Sleep was kind of the thing I would grab onto and, and pour my energy into. And, um, and so I wrote, I wrote, I wrote, I wrote, uh, the script landed it. I think it was 150 pages, uh, that, that came in. Um, it was, it was a phone book of a script and, um, <laughs> and I sent it to Stephen King and to Warner Brothers at the same time um, and was completely nauseous about that. And Steve got back and he said, I'm halfway through it and I love it, uh, but I'm putting it down because my son's getting married and I'm going off uh, to the wedding. So I'll pick up the second half when I'm back. The half that he was likely to have yeah. an issue with. And I'm like, yeah, <laughs> exactly. I'm like, that's the half you're going to hate. So uh, great. <laughs> awesome. Um, and so while he was he was off at Joe's wedding, uh, Warner Brothers read it and they came back and they greenlit the movie almost immediately. Um, between the success of It, which was a huge boon for the studio, um, and they legitimately loved the script. Um, to everyone's shock, they came back and said, we got a green light on this, on this movie. And they said at the time, they thought it might've been the fastest green light that my executives had ever seen at the studio, um, which began us on a foot of incredible enthusiasm from Warner brothers, which remained all the way to the end. And is the only reason that director's cut that you saw exists. Um, but they, uh, they greenlit the thing and said, when you're done with Hill house, you know, we want to get right in it. And, um, that felt great, but we still hadn't heard from Steve. And I had said to everyone that if he came back and didn't like it, I wasn't going to do the movie. Um, and so I held my breath for a couple of days and he came back about a week later and he finished the script and he, and he wrote to me and he said, well, I think it's great. I think it's really, really, really terrific. And I really like the choices you've made. I really like the ending. 
you know, I, I love that it pulls in the ending from The Shining and it felt very complete to me. In my experience, um, it's so good that most studios will never make a movie like this. So I, you know, I hope someone takes a chance on it, but if not, just know you, you wrote a good script and let it, let that sustain you <laughs> for the inevitable disappointment. And I, I got to write back and say, funny story, they greenlit the picture um, already. So <laughs> we're, we're going to do it. Uh, and then, and then we were off. So, sorry, that was a very long, long ramble. But. Well, I am curious hearing that, Mike, like if Stephen had written back and said, mm, I really would prefer for you to put all the Kubrick stuff to one side, please, can you make a straightforward adaptation that, that does lie close to the book? Would you have done that? I asked myself that question a lot and, and I, I kicked around different variations on that. Could I do something that's a perceived sequel to Mick Garris's, I think, terrific miniseries yeah. with Steve yeah. Weber and Rebecca de Mornay? Maybe that's the canon that we embrace. Um, and that that was on my mind as something we could do. My fear with it was this is a meant to be a giant theatrical Warner Brothers movie. Um, the theatrical language of The Shining is owned outright by Stanley Kubrick. And the the Garris miniseries, which I again I love, you know, is television. And not as many people know that visual language not as many people saw it it doesn't have the 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 depth and the reach that that kubrick's film has so i thought if i'm doing that now i'm i'm pushing the film into a more obscure and very specific narrower fan base um and it felt discordant it felt like it's tough to say okay well i'm doing a sequel to this abc miniseries from the 90s but i'm doing it on the big screen um, that doesn't jive. And I didn't, I thought Warner Brothers in particular likely wouldn't have supported that. Um, now their initial draft, Akiva's draft, um, was faithful to the book in that it jettisoned all of the Kubrick um, stuff. It, it was, the Overlook was burned down. Uh, I don't think it, yeah, Dick Halloran was alive, um, if I remember right. Or maybe he didn't really deal with Dick Halloran much, but um yeah, no, he was alive, uh, which is true to the book. Yeah. And um, and it was funny because that was one of the questions Steve asked when I had said I wanted to do the Kubrick. He was like, it wasn't the overlook. He didn't like that. But one of the, his, his big kind of, but how are you going to do it question was about Dick Halloran. He was like, what are you going to do about Dick Halloran's fate if if you're doing that? What about these wonderful scenes with him and Danny? And that to me was the easiest answer. It was like, oh, it's the same scene. It's just when Wendy shows up, Danny's alone because Dick's a ghost. And and the only thing we know for sure is Danny Torrance can see and interact with ghosts. <laughs> so, um, you know, that that's no problem to me. I, I was like, that just that's one shot of the of Danny alone by the bench solves the whole thing. Um, And he was like, oh, yeah, yeah I, guess, I guess that makes sense. But uh, but yeah, I I think. If he had asked me to to try to do a version where the hotel was indeed burned down, um, I would have tried. But I would have had the same feeling with that script that I had when I read the book, which was just a, a real sense of deflation and missed opportunity. And I, I likely would have delivered that draft and I probably would have gracefully backed away from it and and um maybe uh just do dove in they already wanted another haunting like dove into blind manor and like i don't have time let somebody else direct it um so i, I could protect the relationship with steve but uh but yeah i thankfully we, we didn't have to make that call but it it i i know for a fact i would have stepped away from the whole thing if he just said don't, I don't like this script. Um, yeah. But it's interesting. You, you mentioned at the top there how, you know, King was expressing his anxiety about his own relationship with alcohol and how it might destroy his family. If that was the fear that King was exercising when he wrote The Shining, and if the fear, from what I know of Kubrick, um, in his retelling, the fear 
that he seemed to be expressing was that there's there's a madness within us all, specifically in men, in patriarchs, and it's kind of simmering beneath the surface and it only really needs a nudge to then boil over. What do you think the fear was that was motivating Dr. Sleep? Was, was there something, did, did you did you gravitate towards either one of those particular kind of motivating fears? Or was there something else entirely that you think consciously or subconsciously was driving this thing? Uh, Dr. Sleep, I, I felt that if, if the shining is about addiction and, and the anxiety of what that can do, Dr. Sleep is about recovery. Um, both the journey to recovery, the responsibility of recovery, and then the kind of sober reckoning that, that comes at the end of it with that beautiful cyclical nature of King that, that, you know, when you have a, a mentor and a student and Danny was the little boy and Dick Halloran was the mentor that eventually this would come back around. That's the, you know, the caught as a wheel, uh, dark tower, um, theme in there, but, uh, but that the, what I loved about it was that, you know, um, Dr. Sleep was about redemption and about taking generational trauma or being the child of an alcoholic, wrestling with your own things that, that there, there isn't a preordained fate to that. And, and, um, you know, King, when he's writing Dr. Sleep, he's, he's decades sober. Uh, his children are grown. So, you know, his, his little, little children that he was looking at while he worked on The Shining are now adults. And acclaimed um, authors. And acclaimed authors in their own <laughs> yeah. right. And, um, and so there's, there's, a, there's a beautiful kind of other side to that coin um, that's all about recovery, healing, and how to process trauma in your past. And these are all things that thematically are, it's like ringing the dinner bell for me. I mean, these are my favorite things in the world. So, um <laughs> So, you know, I, I think the the fear of um of Dr. Sleep is is more about the reflection of sobriety, the fear of relapse, and looking at this world with the clear eyes of sobriety um and realizing that becoming sober doesn't remove the dangers from the world at all. In fact, it only means you're able to see some of them more clearly. Um, and I think uh, Dan Torrance is the embodiment of a fear of trauma. He has this incredible ability with The Shining that he will not use. He actively refuses to, to use it because he was so traumatized. Um, and the first third of the book is about him starting as his father, but choosing a different path and and living with that path and then the, the second half of the book is about him overcoming the fear of expressing himself for who he really is which is a, a beautiful allegory about how we process childhood trauma um and to try to reconcile what happened to him as a kid try to right the wrongs of his father and to hand the baton to the next generation and hopefully break that cycle of trauma um, and so I found Dr. Sleep, the book, to be way less about the fear, although there's terrifying things in there, especially about the danger that the world poses to um, to children, to people who are different, to people who shine, to, you know, um, that the overlook is just one mouth and a creature that's the size of the, the planet. I, it terrified me. But... Um, you know, all that's there, but it's it's a story about hope and redemption and breaking a cycle. And um, that, to me, felt like such a beautiful counterweight to the Kubrickian vision of Jack Torrance, that the two together wouldn't take anything away from each other or change anything. They'd really just complete and enhance each other. Um I love, I've, I've gotten to watch the movies back to back in the theater once. It was the coolest thing. And um, so, yeah, that, that that's what I responded to. And and I think King is fast to say that, you know, that, yeah, the the shining is, is alcoholism, but Dr. Sleep is recovery. And that the shining is ice and Dr. Sleep is fire. And, you know, um, it's, it's a, about balance and yeah. 
that was a I can't think of another scenario that would ever give a writer the opportunity to do something like that. Like, it, and it's just because it's all because Steve wrote Dr. Sleep when he wrote it. Um, how do you do a sequel to a seminal piece of work decades after the fact? You know, he he did. So we were able to. And I'll never I can't imagine I'll ever have that opportunity again. Um, it's such a it's such a rarefied thing um, in a world that's all about retreads, reboots, and, and studio politics when it comes to <laughs> revisiting IP. This was yeah. This was such a different thing. It was it was really that we got to take this sculpture that Kubrick had made and flip it over and build our own on the back until it was a complete complete thing. So, yeah. And you mentioned like intergenerational trauma there i think like one of the things that's so remarkable and and bordering on radical about dr sleep is you know there's there's a desire for danny to not become his father and the triumph of his arc in this film it's able to be a victory for him at the end of the film despite his fate that he not only broke the chain he didn't become his father he was able to do what his father couldn't but he's also able to kind of forgive his father and see his father through different eyes. And the, the, the film engenders an empathy towards Jack, this, this iconic character in horror history who previously hadn't been humanized that way. There are moments in Dr. Sleep that I think intrinsically change how you view Kubrick's The Shining because your view of Jack has been not quite softened because that suggests like watering down or, or a shirking away from his violence in the Kubrick movie. But you certainly add nuance to his descent into madness and uh, the scene in which Danny's at an AA meeting, realizing his father may well have stood in the same exact place. After so many decades as this like icon of horror, you know, Jack existed kind of prior to Dr. Sleep, almost in the same category as, as a Freddy or Jason in terms of how he was thought of as this monster. But in Dr. Sleep, you go through the process of seeing him as a person. So yeah, I'd be really interested in digging into that, Mike, and sort of understanding what you felt was so interesting or, or perhaps even useful societally about that, kind of understanding those who commit violence, who the temptation is to tar as evil, but perhaps there's a little bit more to it. In the novel, The Shining, the empathy for Jack is unavoidable because Jack is an avatar for Steve. Yeah. You know? And... And so Steve has a lot of conflicting ideas about his addiction and, and to what extent his personal culpability comes into play for it. And, and so Jack is much more a tragic character who, who is well-intentioned but deeply flawed um, and is, is preyed upon. When, when, when the Torrance family arrives, Danny is the prize for the hotel, but Jack is actually the weakest member of the family and so that's the way in for the for the evil of the overlook um and you're completely right in in kubrick's vision of it in men in general there is this just constant madness that's just underneath and the hotel lifts up what is already there and jack is is monstrous what what's important to me especially if you're talking about addiction it's it's impossible to to tell a story about addiction and recovery if you're if you're viewing it through the lens of kind of a a, a binary look at good and bad. Um, the the world is just much more nuanced and, and complicated. And I, I don't think there was a moment where I thought like, oh, we have to make a statement about humanizing monsters. I do think there are people in the world who are irredeemably monstrous and whose reasoning or backstory, you know, I am not interested in. The Bevs of Midnight Mass. Yeah. Or yeah. And through history, you know, there, there are, there are people who I, I'm not willing or wanting to try to see through their eyes or understand their perspective. I, I think their actions have rendered such introspection points. Um, and, uh, you know, Jack Torrance is a domestic abuser. Um, now, whether my read of the Kubrick 
uh, film is that he appears to be a domestic abuser from the jump and is is physically and psychologically abusive to his wife and and his child pre-credits you know um without much nuance and without an apparent uh remorse and um jack torrance in the novel has those moments has absolutely has physically injured danny has psychologically and emotionally abused his wife always um in the grips of alcohol and has come out of it with shame and remorse and a strong desire to try to fix it, but is always teetering back and forth. And, and so like that, that empathy is baked into King's conception of it. Um, there's no way, there's no point in doing Dan's story without that empathy. Like Dr. Sleep is always going to have that empathy for Dan Torrance and um, Dan is going to have a child's recollection of Jack. And he'll remember all of the horrible events of the movie we saw. But he remembers the six years prior to that, too. And he remembers the bedtime stories. And he remembers, you know, playing with daddy. And so Dan's feelings about dad are going to be profoundly more complicated. And while a viewer can look at Jack Torrance in The Shining and say this is a, a monster who's irredeemable and we do not need to seek to understand him any further. There's no way Dan will ever feel that way. Um, in the same way that all of us have profoundly complicated uh, emotional feelings about our pasts and about the people who are a part of them. Um, so there's a certain tug of war there that exists within Dan and because it exists within him, it has to exist in the script. It has to, the viewer has to feel that too. And we were careful. I didn't want to retcon Jack. I didn't want to suddenly be like, Jack was a good guy who, you know, was led astray. It was important that when they finally shared the screen together and Jack got to speak that I felt like this was where that character would go as Kubrick and Nicholson left him. Um, but Dan is different. And one of the things I loved, that's my favorite scene of the whole film is, is uh, the scene with Ewan and Henry at the bar. It's th the reason I wanted to make the movie. And a scene that, you know, exists in neither, in none of the source material. It's not from Dr. Sleep. It's not from The Shining. It's its own thing. And um, we shot it. We used the same... <laughs> the same angles uh, and as much of the same lighting. I mean, we, we really tried to make it as identical as possible to Jack scene at the bar um, and with Lloyd and, um, and the difference would simply be the behavior of the man in the center of the frame. And um, Dan is able to love what he remembers of his father despite what happened which is i think the only way to heal right and this is if this is a story about redemption and healing it's not that you forgive what jack did it's that dan is able to let go of the anger and love the life that's led him to this point in all of it the good and the bad um, and while he doesn't condone Jack's behavior and while he doesn't repeat it, obviously, I think Dan has reached a point having walked enough in Jack's shoes um, with the alcoholism that if nothing else, he somewhat understands parts of it. And um, that's healing is uh, to me is you can't forgive or move on or just just to take care of yourself you can't do it without some effort of understanding and um and yeah so so that that's the other side of the coin that i think steve brilliantly laid out and we got to articulate in a way that was unique because of our hybridization of of the two shinings you know 
Um, but, uh, but yeah, I have taken heat over the years for saying, and I believe it to be true, that Stephen Weber's performance as Jack Torrance in McGarris is Shining um, is a better Jack Torrance than Nicholson's. Um, and uh, I've, I've, I've rankled the cinephiles a few times with this opinion. <laughs> Um, as though I'm taking something away from Kubrick's masterpiece or Nicholson's performance, which is, you know, singular and powerful and, and incredible. But I think the man that King created um, in the pages of The Shining, Weber hits that and understands it and delivers a heartbreaking, tragic performance where Nicholson does not and is not trying to. Um, but yeah, so... It, it's interesting because I, I would, I was like, I, I never want to tip Jack into Weber's Jack. It's, it's always got to be Jack's Jack. But, um, but I, I was always aware that that man is the one who exists in the page and, and that he's in there somewhere, um, whether we see him in the Kubrick movie or not. But the insertion of that scene, I think, speaks to, well, something important to your process and something we didn't get to talk about last time you were on the show, Mike. You know, the empathy that we're talking about here that you extend to Jack, that's something that kind of courses through your entire body of work. And, um, you know, in Hill House, Bly Manor, Midnight Club, the upcoming House of Usher, all your other adaptations, you're translating stories that you love for the screen. And I'm, I'm, I'm curious to know, basically, like how you go about honoring the original versus finding space to kind of imprint that little part of yourself and insert where appropriate Mike Flanagan, you know, to, to take, yeah. take certain liberties with the source text or to add to the source text without sort of, you know, uh, compromising what came before. So is there a process you have for that? Is there something consistent across all these adaptations and, and was it different on Dr. Sleep? Well, you, you kind of have to feel it out, you know, and, and I can't really work on something unless it's, it's resonating with me. Um, and for me, luckily, I, I feel that Stephen King and I operate on a very similar wavelength when it comes to this, um, because he, he writes very humanistic horror and, and King has said, um, there can be no horror without love, you know, the, the, that balance of the darkness and the light, you know, um, I grew up reading him. So I, I imagine there's a certain amount of that instinct in me that is really just a reflection of steve anyway yeah um but uh so so i'm fortunate in that injecting empathy into a stephen king story isn't terribly difficult or even <laughs> necessary because he he has it and and his doctor sleep is more gentle and empathetic than the movie um oddly you know i i i was harsher than he was when when we dealt with doctor sleep with some other characters and baseball um, boy Baseball boy, we were both pretty horrible too. Um, yeah. you know, but I I kill Billy. Uh he didn't. Um, I kill Abra's dad. He did not. Yeah, that's um, right. You know, I I'm 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 like, we'll just, yeah, we'll just brutally kill Dan's best friend <laughs> on screen. And I killed Dan. You know, like I I but that I, I felt like Steve, that's that's Steve's jack ending. So I I I I disavow responsibility for that, <laughs> even though he's like, I didn't, I let Dan live. And I'm like, uh, yeah, but should you have, uh, the, the, uh, <laughs> but with other things, you know, when I became a father, um, <laughs> making sure that there was some hope in these stories became more important to me because my, my feeling, my strong feeling is that, um, there will come a time when my children will no longer have me in the world to uh, to know. And I'm in an incredible position because not many people get to leave behind something as 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 immediately interrogatable as a body of creative work. And um, my kids can watch my my movies or my shows when I'm gone and I think get a little glimpse into how I see the world from them, especially something like a midnight mass. Um, 
And it became important when I started to think of them watching these things that I never wanted to leave the audience of my children without hope, empathy, and a, a gentle suggestion toward forgiveness and that things will be okay. Um, to leave them with a cynical and horrific worldview uh, became untenable for me. Uh, and so the, I, I'm drawn to projects that already have some vein of that empathy in there. I think that's one of the beautiful things about horror is that it, it is a factory of empathy. It helps us deal with our fear of each other and the other and the unknown. And it helps us flex those muscles and get braver and hopefully interact with each other with more kindness. I think that's what what the genre can do. Um, so I, I'm always drawn to those projects to begin with. I try very hard not to change something away from the intention of the piece. And if the intention of the piece is a is away from it, from empathy, I'm probably not going to engage with that material. I, I'm probably not working on that movie anyway. Um, so I, I I've never felt that anything I've injected into an adaptation was in direct contradiction to the intentions of the author. You know, the closest I ever felt to that was at the very end of The Haunting of Hill House, where I changed, I added one word to uh, an incredibly iconic Shirley Jackson line. That did change it. And I wrestled with that for a long time. Um, but I felt like that was the right ending for the story we'd spent 10 hours telling that I felt like celebrated and honored Shirley Jackson throughout. So I, I ended up going with it. But that that's the closest I ever came to questioning whether I'd, I'd gone too far. Can um, you remind listeners of what that what that line was? Yeah, it's the it's the last line. Um, it's uh, it's, you know, silence lay steadily um, and uh, and would. Uh, whatever walked there walked alone. Um, and I changed it to together. And, um, and so yeah, not an addition of a word. It was a change of a word. Uh, but, um, that, that to me takes a final note that is down and bleak and lifts the trajectory into hope. Um, that's a pretty substantial redirection. And, uh, and I've, I've, over the years, I, I look at that and, and I still kind of question it, but I, but if I picture the other version, if I picture that show ending with, with whatever walked there, walked alone, I can't, uh, I, I, I feel like it's, it's a disservice to everything that came before it and not the destination for the crane family. It's just not. And, um, so yeah, so that's the one for me where I felt like there's the most distance. Uh, but in this case, um, I felt like Steve has has such a, a a bedrock for that that kind of humanism in both The Shining and Doctor Sleep that um, that it felt it felt like I was really just kind of turning up the volume here and there on on material that was already there. And if that's, I guess, like if, if we've covered additions there, talk to me about the things you had to cut because, you know, <laughs> the novel is such a behemoth and, you know, there, there are, there's so much detail in there. There's so many like rich little asides, like Abra predicting 9-11 as a baby. Yeah, as a baby. <laughs> Danny yeah. and Wendy's life in Florida. There's there's so much, there, there are uh, entire characters, like Abra's grandmother is a character in the book. Yeah. You know, when, when you first sat down um, with... The film on loop in front of you, the hardbacks, you know, by your side. How did you work out the things that you were going to have to cut? The the th how did you work out what was essential versus what unfortunately had to be put to one side for for making this thing under four or five hours? I, I would go through with different colored highlighters, and I would hit things that like I have to I have to do this. I this has to be in there. Um, it is a sprawling story, and and today I think it would be really in today's marketplace, I expect you'd have better luck going to Warner Brothers and saying, I want to develop Dr. Sleep as a limited series for HBO Max yeah. than as a theatrical feature film. I believe that completely. Um, and it would have been a great limited series. 
and and that some of those details are incredible. The Abra's infancy and childhood is fascinating. The True Knot and their because um, they're they're present uh, on nine eleven to feed on the fear and the anguish of the day, which is a one of the things King does where he where he pulls kind of he pulls these fantastic ideas into the context of something very real and immediate um, that makes the story, you know, really hit different, um, you know, and, and, you know, with, with Abra's grandmother, um, who we mentioned in the scene, but that was as close as we got, you're right. She's a huge character and actually instrumental into the defeat of Rose uh, in the book. Um, it's a, it's about what the movie can fit for one thing. And that to me was like, okay, the, the, if I'm just servicing, um, Dan's story, Abra's story and Rose's story, I have a five act movie and I have likely 150 pages. <laughs> That's just to serve the three of them. Yeah. So anything that isn't directly driving them forward needed to be on the potential chopping block. Um, and then it was, okay, well, if, if that's what this is about, if the movie's about these three characters, I have to, by the end, eliminate everything that isn't them. Um, they all have to lose their support systems. They all have to, to lose the kind of the dressing of their stories and, and be reduced to just themselves. And it's the three of them alone at the hotel. That's, that's where it needed to you know, narrowing is the natural state of things. And this huge story has to narrow. So that necessitates eliminating things along the way. Um, in the book, you know, uh, Dr. John, who Bruce Greenwood plays in the movie for like two scenes, is a major character. Um, Abra's father and Billy are, are present uh, at the final confrontation with Rose. There are other members of the Knot still around. You know, there's, there's it didn't, it felt like it was still so big it never whittled down to what it was about with just the three of them. Um, and so figuring out what needs to go is really just what doesn't feel like it's vibrating with these three main storylines. And then there are other choices. You know, there's a major thing in the book about Abra's uh, lineage. That's right. Yeah. There's a um, family connection. Huge family. Con like he literally is her uncle. Um, and, and there's this big twist that you find out Jack had an affair, um, with Abra's, uh, grandmother, which is why she's such a big character. And so Abra has Torrance blood in her, which is, you know, how they explain why she has the shining and her connection with Dan. And I had this kind of Skywalker issue with it where I, I, say, I yeah. it makes yeah, the universe I, smaller. I, it does. And I loved that, you know, there are just people who shine and, you know, Dick Halloran wasn't related to the Torrances. You know, th this isn't a necessary thing for the, for the movie. It, it, it was neat in the book and it, it became critical to how they defeated Rose in the book. Um, but it's things like that, that I, I felt like were, it doesn't mean they're good or bad. It's just that, do they fit the shape of this sculpture of this movie that we're building? And that, felt like it didn't need to be there and that Abra doesn't need an explanation for how she got this ability. And I liked that, that they were strangers. I liked that, you know, she was as random a person in his life as he was to Dick Halloran. And um, so that simplifies things and jettisons a good amount. And, and uh, <laughs> that, that's a, that's a great thing when, when something can simplify your, your job, that's great. There's another major plot point um, into how the true knot are killed in the book. Is it measles? It's measles. That's right. Yeah. Um, the baseball boy had measles, and the true knot absorbed that when they fed on the steam, and the measles begins to kill the true knot. And uh, while I thought again, that's a fascinating idea. Um, it to me severely limited their effectiveness as villains that if Dan and Abra don't intervene, they're, they're going to die of the measles anyway. Um, it, it's the Raiders of the Lost Ark problem, right? Which is if, if, yeah, if Indiana Jones didn't get involved, the outcome would have been the same. Um, <laughs> and they would have opened the Ark and melted their faces at the end, you know, um, he just, <laughs> I had never realized that. 
Yeah, he, it's crazy. The only thing Indiana out. Jones does in that whole movie is put other people in danger. It's a, I mean, it's a great movie, but if they had just gotten the ark, they would have opened it up and wiped themselves out. But thanks to Indiana Jones, like a whole bunch of other people died who otherwise would have lived. So you know, um, so it, these are the screenwriting. These are the nerdy things writers talk about all the time because, of course, that that isn't you know. That is not a flaw with the Raiders of the Lost Ark. It has had no impact over the years whatsoever to the effect of that movie. Um, but for this, it, it was very much the true not as monsters, as things to fear, as, as a force that tells me as the viewer that Dan has to do something, that he has to put aside decades of trauma and step out into danger again. Um, that to me felt felt disproportionate. Um, the true not needed to, I, need, I needed them to kill other people, not just the baseball boy. I needed to see their danger, you know, and take out people who matter to Dan and Abra. Because they're, as they kill members of the true not and they take away Rose's family, it's about balance, you know? Um, and, and so that meant I could lose the measles storyline. Um, and make it much more about the the fight. What's this movie really about? This movie's about Abra, Rose, and Dan. Dan is someone who uh, overcame his addiction and found sobriety and recovery, and Rose is the opposite. Rose is someone so addicted to life that she, like Stephen King was worried about what he might do to his family because of his addiction. Rose is... Uh, thrilled to travel the country murdering innocent people to feed hers. Um, Dan has a, a pupil in Abra, someone who he needs to show the way. Um, Rose has a pupil in Andy. Um, all of these are mirror images of each other. And, you know, every choice Dan makes, Rose makes the opposite. And, and it's a battle of ideas and perspectives. And in the center of it is a character who's more powerful than any of them, but who is young and who can go either way. And who both the protagonist and antagonist say, you remind me of myself. <laughs> so, you know, Abra has Rose in her and she has Dan in her and could, could turn either way, depending on the circumstances of her upbringing. And that is where Dan Torrance is more qualified than anyone else to know how to best take care of her without patronizing her, without shielding her from the reality of the dangers of the world. And, and so it's all about symmetry. And, and you get into this, you need symmetry in, in your plot structure. I, I'm a big believer in structure that you, if you have a problem with the end of the movie, it means you have a problem with the beginning of the movie. That if, if something comes out of left field, you didn't set it up everything in the first half is lightning everything in the back half is thunder and it all has to connect um symmetry is beauty you know that's why we look at a thing and think it's beautiful it has so much to do with symmetry or when we intentionally disrupt that symmetry that makes it art and it makes people think and it makes them feel uncomfortable or, or comfortable or intrigued and um and so this story had a number of things that had to happen to remain symmetrical. And um, the crazy thing was it didn't just have to be symmetrical within the pages of the Dr. Sleep script. It had to find symmetry with Kubrick's film as well. And that there needed to be lightning in that movie that had thunder in my movie. And that together they needed to narrow to the same point. And um, so structurally, it was it it remains maybe the the biggest challenge of of my career thus far, but it was so fun and and I frequently would bump into things that had to happen, and um, once once the the story has its own gravity and begins to have its own physics and starts to say, you know, Billy has to die here and has to die through Andy, you know, like that that this. The, the hierarchy of the characters matter. The way they pair off matters. Um, you know, Abra's dad has to die at this point, which means that Abra's mom has to be gone, which means that 
she has to come back, which means that Abra has to be on the it, it It starts to dictate things. And then you feel like you're not writing something, you're excavating something. Um, and the decision, the story exists outside of you and you don't have a choice. You're a conduit for it. Yes. And, and that you could make a change to that, but you are literally breaking the laws of physics that exist within this particular story. And um, now you're asked to do that all the time. That's the definition of a network note or a studio <laughs> note is, can you please change the laws of physics and do something that makes no sense? You know, that that is frequently what you get from executives. I didn't get much of that at all on Dr. Sleep. I had some of the best executives I've ever worked with on this movie who understood what it was and who supported it. And when they saw the movie coming together, and we all realized it was a three hour movie. <laughs> and they said, we cannot release a three hour movie in theaters. We're not gonna tell you how or give you insulting notes. We're just gonna say, it has to be two and a half, but we will release the three hour cut. Um, you know, that that's an unprecedented level of, of creative support and respect. And I've never seen its equal in any of my other, other jobs. Um, I only wish I wish I delivered for them in that I wish the audience had shown up theatrically to make them, you know, feel that that all of this was 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 worth it. But uh, they feel that way anyway. Thank goodness, um, because the audience showed up in VOD. But uh, but the um, yeah. So it, I know this is weird, and I feel self conscious talking about structure like this. But that that very much is what it felt like. That that it was all. Uh, a mix of balance, um, symmetry, and things that had to happen. And anything that didn't seem to fit that structure was very easy to, to jettison. Well, let's dive into the, the script, Mike, which uh, you were kind enough to send over. It, it's an early draft. So I, I should actually ask, I guess, before we go any further, all of these changes that you say had to happen, did you mm -hmm. work those out at outline phase or were there earlier drafts before the one I've seen where you were kind of realizing that there were mistakes in here, that some of the symmetry wasn't adding up prior to this, this version, which is quite close to, um, to what you shot. Um, that happened in outline for me. Uh, you have the first finished draft of mine. Um, now the film was greenlit very fast. Uh, this project just didn't go through many iterations. You probably noticed it doesn't have like the hedge maze scene at the end. Yeah, I did notice. Um, and, which was a reshoot that was a, an addition after the fact. Um, but yeah, this script did not change much. Um, but my outline for the script changed all over the place. That's where a lot of the work would go. Or I'd start to write something into the pages, realize I had a problem, back up, hit the outline again, go to the source material again, come through it, try to solve it. And then I just delete that paragraph and keep going in the new direction. Um, one of these days, we'll have a conversation with a, a script that has changed drastically. I'll, I'll try to think of the best one to send you for that. Yeah, sounds good. Um, those those exist. Uh, <laughs> the the shooting scripts for the Midnight Club, for example, and um, when we closed the writers' room and locked our scripts, and the scripts that we shot could not be more different. Um, to the point that there was never a cult in the, in the original show that <laughs> wow that was shoved in by netflix after the fact the the um yeah the things can change radically this one um the battleground is really the outline and the script fell together in a way that i was happy with and steve was happy with and warners was happy with so there were tweaks and a few additions by the end after production where always they want to shoot they always want to shoot new stuff they always want to what if we add something and uh, that'll, that'll change everything. And, and in this case, they wanted to add that big hedge maze sequence at the end. Um, but, uh, but yeah, it, most of the, most of that work happened in the outline phase. So what were some of the big changes in the outline phase when things were drastically different, as you say? Um, I recall uh, I did have a, a third act where Billy and uh, Dave Abra's dad um, had survived after the shootout and were on the road with uh, with Dan and Abra to the Overlook. Um, I, I, I walked down that road a little little ways 
before I didn't know what to do with them when we got there. And I had characters waiting in a car. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> uh, and, and just, uh, and when Rose arrived, I was like, she's just going to kill him. Cause it has to be Rose, Dan and Abra at the end. Um, there would have been something quite fun about those guys just sitting in the car, listening to the radio though, while this yeah. epic showdown goes down. And then should we get in there? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I really hope your daughter's okay, man. Yeah. yeah. Like, um, I, I had scenes that I'd outlined that were just more in all from the book, especially of kind of snake bite Andy's initiations and, um, learning the rhythms of the different relationships within the true knot. Um, and I, I realized early in the outline process that it couldn't sustain that, that that felt like a fourth thread that I was trying to braid with Rose, Dan and Abra. Um, so that went away. And um, <clears throat> there was an early uh, version that had the final showdown happening while the hotel burned down. So the boiler would go off and then he fought with Rose. Oh, wow. Okay. Um, uh, but it just felt like a, it just felt like we were turning what should be an emotional confrontation into a VFX extravaganza. Yeah. Yeah. And at one point I was like, if I see you and McGregor running around using a magical force while everything around him is, is on fire and he makes it to the top of the stairs in, <laughs> I've got the higher ground, Anakin. He's going to say he has the high ground <laughs> that, that at, at a certain point, you know, it's starting to get a little ridiculous. Uh, and, and was going to get two Jedi, um, but, uh, and expensive as hell. Um, so I, I backed off that. I remember and said, I'm going to literally do the ending of the shining so that the boiler explosion is the last event that that's the, that's, that's the final bell of, of, of the, of the story. Um, and uh, my version early had less, believe it or not, less uh, what what I kind of look at as fan service in the Overlook itself. Um, everyone was so excited when we rebuilt it, and everyone everyone transformed down to the the most powerful executives at Warner's who came to visit set turned into kids when we were in the Overlook. Um, there's something about that space. It's like walking through your own memory and you, you smile. It's the, you feel like a kid. And we had a, we built a adult size big wheel. Um, <laughs> the cast and crew took turns riding through the halls of, of the hotel. Uh, I remember one night and we'd chase each other with our cameras to like get the shot of us all doing it. <laughs> And we stayed after rap doing it. You and McGregor rode around like five times. Rebecca Ferguson rode. I, have, I was the one filming Rebecca. And they turned off the lights on us because we'd been there so long and they wanted <laughs> us to leave. And we didn't. We, we lit the whole space with our cell phone lights and we just kept going for hours. Um, that enthusiasm turned into a desire from the studio to have more shining callbacks. And to have things in there that were just there, because wouldn't it be cool if you saw this or wouldn't it be cool if we got to do this moment? Um, and it turned into moments that do not advance the plot or character. And in general, any moment that doesn't advance plot or character needs to go. And it's, it's one, of the, one of the criteria that happens in the outline phase for me that's the most important. And a, a moment could be awesome, but which of those does it advance? And if the answer is neither, it needs to go. And we have stuff in Dr. Sleep that advances neither. Um, and it's all in the overlook. It's it, the blood in the elevators for me is the most pointless moment of the entire film. Um, it's not in my script. It, it is, they wanted to do the bloody elevators. Uh, and they wanted to do it so badly that I, I was kind of overruled. And it was like, sure, okay, we'll, <laughs> we'll do it. And so we filmed Rebecca walk by and they spent a fortune because it's all digital. The Our angle for the blood is higher because Kubrick shot it from a child's perspective. It's low angle. And we shot it from Rebecca's perspective, which meant we had to recreate all the fluid behavior of the blood coming out of the elevators, but to do it from a different angle. So it's 100% new and digital. 
and um, an enormous amount of work and refinement went into this shot that the whole time I was saying, this has nothing to do with the story. We're <laughs> like, <laughs> Rose walks past this and goes, ah, and then keeps going. And then the movie continues. Like it doesn't, it doesn't do anything. And um, there are moments like that in the third act that I, you won't find in my script that you will find in the movie. And I kind of go, oh, okay. You know, <laughs> we were all, you have to understand, we were all very excited to be there. <laughs> So there, there was, there was a, we, we got a little giddy about it and, and, you know, the hedge maze as well snaps in the moment right before the hedge maze sequence and the moment right after are identical. It's, you know, Ewan does a little force push and Rebecca says, no, that's it. Everything that happens in the hedge maze changes nothing. Um, nothing at all. It's it just, we, they wanted to run through the hedge maze. So like, we had to do it. And, and um, so, yeah, so when, when, but when a studio is just enthusiastically asking to add stuff that's harmless, it's like, okay, sure. Like I, I'm, I'm always up for those kind of notes. And, and I, I thought like, well, we'll cut it anyway, or it'll be an extra bonus feature, but they test audiences love that stuff. Oh, I bet. Like, Sometimes Radiohead they, have to play creep. Sometimes yeah. you got to play the hits, right? Yeah, you got to do it. And when the when the blood came out of the elevators and the first test screen in the audience clapped, and I knew we were we were we, we were stuck with it forever. Yeah, you know the um. So yeah. Uh, other than that, though, um, yeah, there, there, there. I can't remember much. Oh, there was more of um of grandma. Right. Okay. Um, there was more of her in the outline. And uh, we allude to it where uh, Abra's mom says she's going to visit her and ask if she'll be okay and stuff. But we had, we'd seen her on screen a couple of times in, in the original outline that I, I got rid of it because she didn't go anywhere. But, yeah. but in, in terms of like, you know, the studio notes you were getting and, you know, your gratitude that, you know, they could have been a lot worse. You know, I'd much rather be in a position where they're asking me to add in those crowd pleasing moments rather yeah. than, you know, um, pushing you to take various scenes that are a bit more challenging or go against convention, asking you to, you know, to rewire those to kind of fit more into conventional screenwriting logic. I mean, for, for example, the, the film starts not with Danny, who's our protagonist, not with Abra, who's, depending on your angle, like also the protagonist, secondary protagonist. It, it starts with Rose the Hat and she's luring a young girl picking flowers to her death. And it, it sets up nice and early the threat and the terror of the movie, as well as the kind of like fantastic universe expanding idea at the heart of Dr. Sleep of, of these kids with Danny's abilities, as seen in The Shining, being preyed upon by this vampiric troop of bohemians, um, known as the True Knot, <laughs> as we've said. Um, they feast upon the psychic essence of these kids. The film does not belong to them. They are Rose is the antagonist, and yet it's there that we start this story. Why was that the perfect place to start, Mike? And uh, yeah, who were the true not to you? We've kind of danced around it a little bit. Yeah. Uh, so that that scene uh, is not in the book. Mm. Um, and uh, I I wanted to open with the threat, you know, that that to to buy the real estate, which I knew was 40 minutes to just get to know everybody. We had to open with the threat. Tell us what the movie's about. You know, tell us what the thing is we have to stop. Um. And I, for whatever reason, kept thinking about um, Frankenstein with that scene and the, and the little girl um, at the river's edge, only in that the monster is well-intentioned but confused, and in ours, they're evil. In the book, the true knot are geriatric. They're, they're described as kind of old people in RVs who are kitschy and wear American flag shirts and and are really like just trying to to be these 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 old people you never think twice about uh, but they're traveling the country doing this thing and i was afraid that they would visually read as funny and i understood in the novel why that choice was made because it, it disarms you um but i thought if i saw these people i would i would think they were funny and um so we made them younger and we decided that kind of in that, when you say bohemian, you know, 
that that is kind of where we were going. It it, it was that they've been alive so long they do not ascribe to any particular time period and that they keep souvenirs. And if you look at their wardrobe, Crow's wearing a Civil War era belt yeah. uh, on top of a shirt from the 20s um, and a hat that's, you know, uh, from the 40s. And Rose has got these trinkets and jewels and styles from different decades of things that they enjoyed because the benefit of living so long is you get to enjoy all of it. And so everybody's this kind of mosaic of the things they liked over a huge period of time, which made their style really fun and and let the actors work with wardrobe to come up with these incredible silent indicators of character that no one will ever notice. That like you'd have to sit and like scrutinize each of them one at a time to to see the story that they're wearing. And that to me was it, was that if you're gonna, if these characters travel the world killing children, which they do because they're cowards, right? They could, you, we see Rose feeds from Dan at the end. They could do this to adults. They don't because adults will fight back and adults aren't as trusting of them. They are cowards and they're going for the path of least resistance, which is why they, they prey on, on kids. But why? Why do any of this? It's it's the addiction to life. It's the addiction to, you know, the pleasures of life. And that was something I wanted to be. Instead of like, they're, they're just these old people chilling out at a campsite. It's like, no, like Rose is wearing, you know, T-shirts from rock concerts. And uh, when you look at what she's buying, Rebecca had so much fun filling her shopping cart for the supermarket scene. Um, you know, like the, the, the hedonism of it, it's like, it's like ancient Rome. It's, it's an orgy of pleasure, you know, sometimes in the book, literally. And, um, so the true knot for me became about these people have made a, have made a deal with themselves that they will do the horrible thing so that they can just collect all of the good, fun leading things about life that are not the point all the easy stuff they they do the easy shit whereas dan a creature of recovery every day is about the hard stuff and um but these these people live to the moment they indulge every impulse they collect these experiences that are so hollow because there there is no mortality to make it mean anything you know, um, that's who they were for me. And you could make a whole movie about them um, that I think would be fascinating and uh, about that trade-off. But it's it's such the opposite of the weight and the meaning you get out of, out of Dan and Billy and Dick Halloran and, and these people to whom the joys of life mean an enormous amount because they know the cost of them. They wrestled with the other side of it and the loss and the trauma. And so what they hold dear is there's a humility to that. It's, you know, every day alive, not in the grip of addiction is beautiful and is a gift, but is work, it takes work and sacrifice to do it. Whereas for the true not every day is a gift that someone else must sacrifice everything to afford them. And it's, it's, they're the most selfish and kind of cowardly of King's antagonists and monsters. And um, they resonate a lot with me because I think I see them in the way we talked last time about how they're, you know, Bev Keens in Congress. There are a true knot all around us. Um, and they, they resonated with me in a, in a pretty big way. Um, they felt very relevant. They felt very American. Um, yeah, sadly. But. You know, you mentioned about the symmetry, how Dan represents the opposite of their cowardice in that he has to, he has to do the hard work. That is not where we begin with with this character or the adult version of the character 
And it's fascinating the way we are introduced to to Ewan's iteration of, of Danny in this story. Conventional screenwriting logic, again, to go back to that, it dictates that the opening scene uh, in terms of the introduction to a character, a protagonist, it's supposed to be where, you know, the film signals to an audience that they're a good person, they're worthy of our empathy, they're worthy of our compassion. Instead, Danny, when we meet him, is throwing up into a grotty toilet. He's possibly killed someone in an attack that you you don't soften by showing some provocation, some reason for him to descend into violence. He steals $100 from the stranger next to him who's unconscious in a pool of her own vomit. And when he finds a toddler who in the script you described as having bruises down his arms as a sign of abuse, he, he just leaves them. And uh, yeah, it's a, it's a fascinating place to to meet Danny. And it's also, as I say, quite quite unconventional. Can you talk to me about like the degree to which, like, yes, Danny has worked out how to keep the literal ghosts of the Overlook at bay in the years since we we left him in The Shining, but there are there are scarier ghosts, ones of PTSD and lingering childhood trauma that when we first meet him, those ghosts he can't outrun. So if if The Shining is about addiction, and and I believe it is, and Doctor Sleep is about recovery, um. A story of recovery starts at rock bottom. That's where the recovery process begins. And I think it's no accident that that's how, that's how King introduces us to Dan as an adult, you know, um, is at the lowest point. And he gives a huge swath of the novel to watching Dan crawl out. Um, and it takes years. You know, Dan, the hero of the movie, we don't meet until we jump eight years into the future an hour into it and start to realize, you know, yeah, this is, this is our guy. Oh, no, we know it from the beginning. And, and frankly, a, a good amount of that, if there's ever an actor who you want to introduce puking and stealing <laughs> and doing horrible things who you're going to like. Yeah. You and McGregor. He's done it before. Yeah. It's, it's the, and that was critical to the casting of that. Cause you put someone else in there. Yeah. You're not going to like that character. You know? Um, and you, and Dan, Dan has so much, you know, he's crawling out of the, the after effects of the trauma of the shining. And I, th I think Steve too would, would say that those aftershocks have to be proportionate to the degree of trauma and Jack's attack on the family is so seismic that, you know, Dan, that, that, that hole that opened up in the earth dan fell into it you know for decades and has finally hit the floor when we meet him um and that's that's the redemp that's the redemptive arc that's that's for me why you tell a story about dan torrance is it's about symmetry the shining is about the fall of jack torrance um it's it's about him starting at a, at a moment of hope and and sober and his complete free fall um into darkness that ends when he dies as he hits the bottom right and so the symmetrical version of that is the story of dan starts at that bottom and it's about his climb up um and i thought that was beautiful uh there's something else to this that i think is important to mention. Um, and we talked about it a little on the Midnight Mass uh, episode, but making this movie is when I got sober. So I, I stopped drinking during production of Dr. Sleep. And um, the the message in the book and, and the, the story of recovery and sobriety and everything um, ended up resonating with me profoundly and uh my wife will tell you that you know over the years i'd written so much about addiction and had been wrestling with my own issues with alcohol but not able to confront them and she said she could see it all over that scene with dan and jack that that was an internal conversation that i was having um and it was working on this movie that i think finally unlocked it for me. Um, and I was surrounded 
by people who understood because you and McGregor, when we shot, this was eight years sober, just like Dan, um, Rebecca Ferguson, I think was four years sober. Um, a number of cast and crew members were already on the other side of recovery. And, um, so I had a very different experience than with some of my other projects where, you know, we in the cast go out and get rip roaring drunk on a Friday night or at a rap party, you know, th that this was not that show like this, this was very much, um, a demonstration to me of what recovery looked like in practice at work with people who knew what they were talking about. Um, and I found it so inspiring, uh, that I, I sobered up and it was a year after, uh, the film was done. And so on, on my, my first birthday, my first year sober, um, that I, I admitted it, I didn't tell people about it. It was just a choice that I made. My wife knew, and I was dealing with it as much as I could outside of any, I didn't want people to know about it in case I fell on my face or something. So like, um, but I, I got in touch with Stephen King and, and said to him, Hey, this is my, my one year sober. Um, and I don't think it would have happened if I didn't do Dr. Sleep, um, your, your book and your characters and living in your story the way I did, uh, affected me that much. Wow. Um, and, uh, he wrote back and, and said, congratulations. And that's great. And he was celebrating 30 years at the same time. We have the same, same date by coincidence. Wow. Yeah. And, um, and so I get in touch with him every year on that date, regardless, just to say hi and say thanks and to say congratulations, but I'm four, four and a half years sober now. Congratulations. And this movie, thank you. Thank you so much. Uh, this movie is profoundly important to me because aside from the King and the Kubrick and the joy of making it, because I had so much fun making this movie, um, regardless of, of all of the other things of it, you know, this was a, a, an experience lived that changed who I am and helped me finally kind of uh, come to terms with with a, a lot of who I am and and make some real changes and I, it, it never would have happened I don't think or it would have happened differently and and later and worse uh, if if I hadn't lived inside the story the way I did I think King's propensity to talk about recovery is so powerful that if you live inside that house he built you you take you take it with you. Oh. That's so beautiful, Mike. Like, well, yeah, as I say, congratulations, man. And um, yeah, they, I mean, you talked about Midnight Mass being your favorite project. I suppose it, it's hard to imagine that project being the same because sobriety is so much at the forefront of it. It's hard to imagine yeah. you having been able to write it in the same way without the experience of them making Dr. Sleep prior, I suppose. Yeah, very much. Um, and I've, I've felt for a long time I couldn't have done Midnight Mass if I hadn't gotten sober. Uh, that I would have, I would have only told half the story and I wouldn't have understood what I was talking about um, the way that I, I eventually felt like I did. Um, but yeah, that, that is still my favorite project and the most personal to me. This is my favorite movie that I've gotten to do um, and just means an, an enormous amount. And it, it was, it, I didn't set out with Midnight Mass. I was like, this is so personal to me. With this, I didn't feel that way at all when I started. I, I, this was a really cool way to, to do a Stephen King adaptation of a story I loved and to try to pull off this really cool cinematic magic trick to, to try to, to pull Dr. Sleep and, and Kubrick's The Shining together. It was a cool challenge. It was really fun. It was something I was excited to do. I didn't anticipate it would become very personal. That just happened. And um, so looking back at it, it's, it's very it's very meaningful and very special to me. Um, you know, it, it, uh, it, it's a very singular time and, um, and yeah, I, I, I'm very grateful that Steve felt the way he felt about the movie. I think if, if that had gone another way, I don't know if I ever would have recovered. 
um if he had been like i do not like this movie i, would have, <laughs> I think I, I would have i would have curled up into a little little ball and just never come out again um i was terrified that kubrick's family and 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 the estate would would not like it they loved it um and i had the utterly unique experience that the the I met Stephen King and shook his hand the morning I screened the movie for him at a, a theater in his hometown in Bangor, Maine, and uh, sat next to him in the theater um, for the whole thing. And then uh, he, I watched, I didn't even watch the movie. I watched his reaction to everything. <laughs> and I was like, he likes it. He, he hates it. He likes it. He hates it. And, and at the end he leaned over and he said, you did a beautiful job. Um, and let's, he said, why don't you come on over to the house and we'll have some, some lunch. We went over to his house and chatted. And that's when he said, you know, this, this movie warms up my feelings about, about the Kubrick movie. I, I think this changes it for me. Um, and it was, it was a surreal moment. And, uh, I, I very much wish more people had gotten to experience it in the theater because it was really cool especially in a large format. I saw it IMAX and it was, the theater was empty, but I had a great time. And um, I, I wish more people had gotten to see it that way. But when the movie bombed, when it came out and completely tanked, um, Steve called and he said, the movie's great. It's going to find its, its audience. I was there when The Shining bombed. I was going to say, forget that. yeah, it's really, yeah. yeah. Um, and he's like, I remember it very well uh because i was celebrating a little bit. um he's like the shining completely tanked and found its audience later he said i was there when the shawshank redemption bombed you know like it doesn't matter the i'm not comparing this movie to those i don't think it's on their level but i do think box office becomes this thing that we're especially as you try to make a living making movies you live and die by your opening weekend box office and it just doesn't matter you know, you'd like it to be a hit because it makes it easier to make your next movie and everybody's happy with you. But the audience is fine. The movie's on their own and movies can crush it and blow the box office out and then evaporate like a fart in the wind a week later. And no one will remember them. And I feel like this movie, its audience found it when it hit uh, streaming and VOD. Um, the numbers that I know of were, were really high on HBO max when it first landed. And most people who approach me about it say that they have watched the director's cut. So it's like people went out and sought out that version and that makes me so happy. So yeah, it's, it's been a, it's been a wild couple of years watching it finally kind of catch on, but I, I, I wouldn't have changed anything about, about it. So. Did its performance rob you of the opportunity to kind of continue the story of some of these characters. We haven't really mentioned Abra, but like yeah. I would have absolutely, I found that character so fascinating and I would have watched, you know, obviously I assume you would have only made it with King's Blessing, but I would have watched another film involving her. I would have watched, God, there's, I would have definitely watched a series involving the True Knot as we, as we mentioned before. There's a, there's a wonderful line by Rose as one of the True Knot is dying where she talks about how they watched Empire's Rise and Fall, cheered on the gladiators in Rome. And it basically alludes to this grand history that they've experienced. And God, I'd definitely watch a prequel series kind of following them, them through time. Had you had other stories set in this world, set with some of these characters that you had, you had started to dream up that then the performance of the film at the box office kind of meant what was no longer going to be feasible? Yes. And, and that, that's the heartbreaking part of it. Um, we were, because studios love universes, you know, any, any franchise ability is like uh, candy for studios. They, they, they look for any opportunity. And this actually had one I thought was organic. And so we were developing and had made deals on um, a Dick Halloran prequel that focused on uh, on Dick Halloran and the events that led up to him becoming um, the cook at the Overlook. We had an origin of the Overlook Hotel project that was 
the building of the hotel. Wow. Um, we had, uh, I had talked to Steve about, I, I agreed that I would love to do another Abra Stone uh, movie. And my thing was like, are you going to write more about her? Because you could write another novel about Abra. And he was like, maybe, maybe. And it's like, if you do, I will, you know, I will jump headfirst into that. I thought Abra is just the coolest. And Kylie was so great uh, playing her. I, I would love to have made that. Um, so yeah, we had all those on deck. Um, on Monday, okay. they evaluated the box office performance, and by Tuesday, it was those are dead. Um, yeah, uh, and the you know I think the Overlook one reverted. Uh, someone else is doing that as a TV show. Um, I believe it was, I don't know if it's happening, but it was developing for a long time. Um, I had a, a great thing for the Dick Halloran movie that I was so excited about, which is him as a young man starting in Derry. It had a little overlap with it because in 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 the canon, you know, little Richie Halloran uh, has an encounter with Pennywise as a young man. And um, but then it was going to be this whole other thing where he joins the army and ends up uh, trying to work in law enforcement in New Orleans in a heavily segregated police department and um, is up against a kind of a cousin to the true knot, like killer who's uh, specifically targeting people who shine. And, um, and this big battle there that would, he'd win the, the battle, but lose the war and, and lose the people that he cared about and end up opting for a quieter life away from all of it and, and taking this job, making meals at this hotel in Colorado. It was going to be awesome. We we're going to open with um, Carl Lumley as Dick Halloran uh, cleaning up the kitchen and, and getting ready for the winter because the winter caretaker and his family are due to arrive. And they're saying, you got to be ready to meet them and give them a tour. And then he, he goes up to room uh, 217 and has a weird thing with the bathtub and it flashes him back to all this stuff through his life and at the end of the story we'd come back to him in the overlook and they'd say the caretaker's here and he'd come downstairs to meet him in the lobby and it you think wow. it's the torrance family but it isn't it's delbert grady and his twin daughters and his wife and you realize you're seeing the beginning of of that story um and god I loved it so much uh but yeah it all it all fell apart and um and I parted on great, great terms with the studio. I still love uh, all, everyone I worked with at Warner's. I thought they did really right by me. And I understood why they they couldn't proceed on those with with the box office that we did. It made sense. It was it was heartbreaking, but it made sense. Um, but uh, but yeah, that that's all kind of gone. And um, you know, there's always hope though. To get back to that, um, not for those projects to be revived, but the thing about the King universe is it's all connected. Um, and the nexus point of those connections is the Dark Tower. Yes, it is. And um, so, you know, and I have I have the rights to that at the moment. I hope I, I'm able to keep them long enough to get it made. But that's something else that always affords opportunities because in the Dark Tower universe, there are all these other characters from the King world who come into play in different ways. And that's one where when you make changes to the source material, you know, to introduce characters who could have played a very important role in that story, the way it was structured, Dr. Sleep was written after the dark tower was finished. Um, Abra stone in the dark tower universe as a breaker is really interesting, you know, um, talking about, uh, there, are, I think there's a character in Dark Tower named Dandelo, who I think is a, a cousin of the True Knot, um, who's this emotional vampire, but who feeds on laughter instead of fear. Um, but there's room in that world for the True Knot themselves. There's room for Rose the Hat. Might be room for Danny Torrance. You know, there, there's all sorts of stuff that could be amazing if we're able to get that property on its feet. There's ways to pull in other things from the King universe. And I think the Shining universe, the Doctor Sleep universe there could very seamlessly dovetail into it especially since in in our movie dick halloran you know all, all but points to the dark tower in his last scene with 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 dan but um 
you know, yeah, so it's all connected. So maybe some of those ideas can find a new way to come back. Um, today, there's just no upside in, in a Dick Halloran origin movie as a theatrical release in today's marketplace. But man, as part of the tower, it could be amazing. So maybe we'll see. Um, we'll see what happens. That's really exciting, man. So obviously the, the last iteration of the Dark Tower was 2017. It sounds like what you're working on is going to take a very different slant on the material. Couldn't be more different. I um, That was the wrong approach to the material, uh, kind of across the board. And it was such the wrong approach that I think it kind of salted the earth for <laughs> anyone else who wanted to plant something under the dark tower, you know, banner for who knows how long, but that's what we're running into trying to get the show going is that the movie did an enormous amount of damage to the potential to getting another iteration up. And they, they were able to overcome it, uh, for an Amazon series, um, that took another different approach and an approach again, that is very different than the one I, I, I am proposing. Um, and that didn't get off the ground. So that has also directly impacted, you know, and I'm at Amazon. That's my, <laughs> that's my studio now for television. And I, it's, I can understand going to them and saying, Hey, would you like to walk exactly down the same title that you spent <laughs> all this money on that you still feel bruised from? You know, I understand, I understand the issues. I, I have to believe though, because our approach is so different than anything that's come before um, and so faithful to the material that there has to be a path to get there. Um, but the journey to the dark tower is just by definition long and fraught and, <laughs> um, and frustrating and all the things. So I think, you know, to, to walk the path of the beam, to really walk it means we are really walking it and uh, I will fight to get that up uh, on its feet as long as Stephen King will allow me to maintain the rights. And uh, he has not threatened to take them away yet. <laughs> um, I know he wants to see that thing made. So if I can't, if I can't get it going, if I can't find a partner willing to do it, you know, uh, the day will come, I'm sure where he's, he's going to need to try to, put his chips somewhere else. I understand that. But at the moment, anyway, we're just going to keep trying and we'll see what happens. Well, my fingers are firmly crossed for that, Mike. Um, I should let you go, man. You've been so generous with your time, not just today, but when we did the Midnight Mass episode. Um, I guess I'll end by asking, you know, as, as we've talked about this, this movie, it didn't find a massive audience on release, but since then has really amassed this groundswell of supporters who really, really care about your vision of this story and are really grateful for the way that um, you've brought back mummy and daddy together, Kubrick and King, <laughs> the warring parents, you've managed to kind of broker peace between them. Um, have you got a message for that community of people who do love this film and are so grateful for what you managed to achieve with it? Oh, I, I just have gratitude for 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 them. I I, I think the people who, who connect to this movie, um, other than that they keep it alive and they keep Everyone who loves it seems to recommend it to other people, which I think is what keeps a, keeps something alive over the years. It's it it makes me profoundly grateful, but um, it makes it worthwhile. It 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 was easy in that first weekend to feel like this was this huge effort for nothing, um, but you guys have proven me wrong and and really validated all the work by so many people who went into this. So I, I have nothing but just intense gratitude for that community of fans uh, who continue to find the movie and, and find that it resonates. Um, that means the world to me. Amazing. Well, that's a lovely note to end things on. This episode's going to come out and then I reckon I'll have about four minutes before the emails come in asking for round three with you, Mike. So, <laughs> well, <laughs> so we'll do round three. Yeah. Look, I've, 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 I've so enjoyed uh, both of our conversations. I'd be thrilled to do more. So we'll, we'll figure something out. Sounds great, man. Well, yeah, thank you so much, Mike. Congrats again on, uh, on well, everything you were able to achieve with this film and everything you've been able to achieve since. I can't wait for The Dark Tower. My fingers are firmly crossed for it, man. And as I say, let's get round three in the calendar. I'd love to, love to do this again. Yes, let's do it. 
You've been listening to Script Apart, hosted by me, Al Horner, produced by Camille Demek. Thanks for tuning in. We'll see you next time.